we every week here at the California Rifle Pistol Association get questions on what are you doing? And that's not a rhetorical device because people obviously know that we're involved in litigation and legislation every week. But I think people are like, do you do anything besides litigation and legislation? And the fact is, we do quite a lot, Kevin. Yeah, we, we have a, a plethora of programs that we're consistently working towards as a staff, uh, mainly to get, at least in my, in my part of the barn here, uh, to get people engaged. But I think what goes unsung, um, maybe far too often, is uh, the dedication to, towards firearm safety and training. Yeah, I think that's something that, I mean, you know, there's a lot of organizations that both nonprofit and profit that have wonderful slogans. Ours has always been be safe, shoot straight, and fight back for your rights is what we're, we're talking about. And or your life or whatever might be on the line that you need to fight for. But those first two words, be safe, I think in a lot of people's minds may seem cliche. But as we both know, that is the start of every program and event that we do or have done for the past 146 years. Yeah. And I mean, it, honestly, it starts before a lot of these events even take place. You know, we we do a we do an event for kids to go out to the range and shoot. Where does that actually start? That starts with getting volunteer RSOs. Those RSOs have to have a certification, and that certification is based in safety and training. Right. And it starts with those advanced teams that we constantly have going out to figure out where we can place programs that meet the needs of the local individuals, whether that be youth-based programs, family-based programs, assisting military veterans and their families, uh, you know, kids who have terminal illnesses and the list goes on before those events ever take place. As you said, not only does CRPA go out and look at the, the host area, check it for safety, work with the, the local government to make sure it's going to be safe. But then where there are areas that need to be brought up, as you just said, maybe we don't have enough uh, volunteers to have the proper training. Our CRPA training team jumps into action and working sometimes alone, sometimes with local trainers when possible, to get those people trained so we can make sure that people are gonna be safe. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's just, it all points back to another program, right? So you got a program that is dedicated towards training people and educating people, and then you have the exterior programs that are dedicated towards getting the next generation out to shoot. We saw that um, at the event that we had at Rahagi's down here in Southern California, not too long ago, you know, uh, I mean, how many how many kids went through that event? Over 1,500 first-time shooters in one day. Our staff and volunteers got to give them an experience after being cooped up for a year and a half because of COVID out there to learn about firearm safety, to teach their parents and guardians about firearm safety, and to make sure that they knew um, how safe they were being. So it was a positive experience that gave those families and those youth a chance to see it's just something they... They want to do in the future, or if not, at the very least, they walk away realizing that the industry and the community is concerned about safety. Yeah, and that actually becomes kind of a, a feedback device as well. You know, I, I mean, it ends up being so surprising whenever you come into a, a new demographic, right? Uh, we, we've had the, uh, um, the event for uh, the hospitalized kids in the past where... You kind of think about somebody like that, a terminally ill youth mm -hmm. who communicates to their hospital, one of the things that I want to do is go out and shoot. You, you, you'd think to yourself, you know, how many kids could possibly be out there that want to do that? And Hundreds. Then, yeah, and, and then the, the, you know, the stats come back and wow, it's not a handful. It's kind of a boatload. You know, so there's definitely enough people in this state to support um, the need for those sorts of programs. And, and we're consistently getting information like that uh, through other programs. And I, I can tell you one that I work with very close is the chapter program that also uh, you know serves as sort of a hub for the community that communicates with us what that community needs. I wanna kind of hover on that bridge that you're talking about the chapter program and just singling out one other program, the ones where we work with the terminally ill youth. And I think one of the things that's so important um, to recognize is that there are a lot of other Second Amendment groups that are out there doing things um, that mirror a lot of the work that we do, um, and that's good. It's a collective work on legislation, getting the right people elected, et cetera. 
But one of the things I'm proud to work for this organization is that we take the entire expanse of the Second Amendment, which includes helping people exercise their rights under that, and one of those being the right to go out and shoot and do family activities like this. And I think, you know, what you do in your chapter program beyond all the wonderful things in legislation is that brings us volunteers into a local area that they know each other, they're working together, they're excited, they're um, impassioned, and they go and meet with those parents because as we know, when we were working with the terminally ill kids at that last event, it wasn't just the 60 youth that were they're dying. And, and I think we, we need to really recognize something. You know, um, when you get to be my age or older, often you start thinking about the quote, bucket list. But you kind of have a, a laissez-faire attitude about some of the items on it. Those kids, as we learned, I mean, it was tear jerking, sometimes only have a eight to 12 week period in that life, last year of their life to execute whatever those bucket list items are. And to find that so many of them want to be in the outdoors with their family, learning how to shoot, fish, hunt, whatever that might be, is amazing to me. And then seeing the families and seeing the emotions, and I mean, it's just, it's a hard day um, for many reasons, but it's also a day that motivates me all the time. And I think motivates your volunteers. Yeah, I, I think it's also a great example of the butterfly effect, if you if you wanna call it that, and how many different parts of our programs actually reflect that throughout California. I mean, when you want to, when you talk about hunting, there's some crazy science coming out these days. Yeah. You know, you know, something that um, is being more so and more so proven to help with autoimmune diseases is um, game meat, uh, game meat. Right. Right. So, you know, we're, we're out here promoting something like this that eventually uh, can lead to game meat going toward hospitalized people for autoimmune diseases. So the, the effects are real and the effects can actually branch out uh, a long way. And, you know, we also see a lot of, a lot of fires in California when you want to talk about uh, maybe how the government has mismanaged uh, some of the things associated with that fire. Um, conservation efforts, uh, you know, that derive from hunting tags mm -hmm. um, is also a real thing. There is not one uh, program or nonprofit out there that donates more money toward conservation efforts in California than the hunting, the hunting community. community. Yeah, and I think it's important too because one of the questions we get asked all the time about the CRP is, well, who do you work with? And that question really should be flipped to who don't you work with in the sense that, you know, you named a big organization in this state from, you know, Rocky Mountain Elk, which is a national-based organization like Ducks Unlimited, um, you know, just to name a couple of ones, I'm, you know, locally, you know, Cal Waterfowl that deals with waterfowl, obviously here in the state, uh, the California Deer Association, you, you have regional areas like the Mendocino Blacktail Deer Association, you, you know, you go up and down the state, Safari Club International, and it's the different chapters. The CRP is and continues to work with all those groups to try to execute programs, to have regulatory policies, everything that not just protects, but expands opportunities. And if you look, despite the mismanagement that you could say by the state on protecting wildlands and things from fires and other natural occurrences, the people going back out and literally doing the boots on the ground work is our community. And CRP is constantly working with all those partners and the Department of Fish and Wildlife and others to get that executed. And I think there's a wonderful legacy that we're seeing being developed. Well, and it's also necessary. I mean, we're also creating coalitions and I mean, chapters you can put in this category, but if you have such a daunting task as the Second Amendment in California, which by the way, I mean, demographically, California is the most diverse and populous demographic in the entire yep. uh, country. So it's almost like we're dealing with several states, but uh, if you are going to take that on, you're going to have to specialize in uh, in partnerships with specific people to get specific things done. You know, we we constantly tell people that any sort of attack on the second on the Second Amendment, even if it's not something that you are uh, you, you know necessarily involved with, is an attack on you because it's something that erodes. And I definitely hold that belief personally. So. 
you know, that's really the only way that you can be efficient and get all of this stuff done is to have those partnerships, to have those coalitions, to specialize in specific things to get to get specific things done. I think it's important too that um, because we're a California-based organization, the oldest one on the Second Amendment conservation estate, it's Californians working for Californians. And while that sounds really simplistic, I think that's important because a lot of organizations that try to do stuff for the Second Amendment, for any of the different derivatives that come from that, are organizations that don't have a lot of boots on the ground here in the state. They, they, they do an amazing job considering some of the limitations that are placed on them. But CRPA, as you said, has adapted to understand that each of the state, parts of the state, are like sometimes their own state. You know, how you help 2A people that live in the Silicon Valley is slightly different than how you help them in the Kern Valley, slightly different how you help them up in, you know, the Shasta area or in the LA Basin, et cetera. I mean, the list goes on. And I think that's one of the things that over, you know, almost a century and a half, we've developed those skill sets, that history and that understanding of those different areas and are able to tailor the the responses when and coincidentally we've developed those assets as an organization through our programs we're consistently getting feedback from these specific areas through our chapter program through our business affiliate program that are consistently feeding us information on you know how how's it going this month mm -hmm. what do you got going on local ordinances you know how 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 does your demographic you know feel they're being represented by their elected officials these are all important you know, questions that need to be asked, and it's a lot of intake. But if we have people from everywhere, you know, feeding it to us, it, it does end up making us, um, you know, it gives us that wisdom a lot, lot quicker. I think innovation is one of the other things I give CRPA um, credit for because we've become incredibly innovative in helping people who have been in programs for 10, 20, 30, 40 years adapt to new programs that are coming up. New, new takes on them, new twists on them. And I really challenge you know, um, all of our members and those that are checking this video out to, to really think about, you know, um, Kevin, you know, I'm older than you, obviously, but I remember when I was a kid thinking, oh my God, if we could just have more than 13 channels on the television set here in LA, I, I would never be bored. Well, now there's like hundreds of channels. There's still boredom times. And, and what I've noticed is, you know, a lot of TV shows are now under third rendition. You know, so it's like, I just watched the other day, Walker, Texas Ranger. I mean, to me, that was so iconic when it first came out with Chuck Norris. Now there's a new guy doing it. And, and that's great because those innovations allow for the story to be changed. Those same types of innovative changes are happening in our community. And I love the fact that we're not just cutting edge, but often CRP is on the bleeding edge of that movement. Well, yeah, and that actually feeds into, uh, um, you know, the political debate in general, something that we need to definitely think about as we're advocating for our rights is that sometimes the, the boundaries of that debate, as it were, change. So being on the bleeding edge, edge is really the only way to make sure we continuously stay educated on those arguments so that we, you know, so that we can continue and be effective in our advocacy. Yeah, and, and I'm going to say this um, and not being tongue in cheek, being a member of an organization, um, be it uh, one that is religious based or politically based or a nonprofit like ourselves, uh, at one point was more in vogue than I would say it is today. And so I think all of us are more uh, skeptical and a lot of us are like, well, why should I join? And one of the reasons I get people to join because I'm not a big joiner kind of a guy. But the one of the reasons I say join CRPA is because we are so expansive, but at the same time, we're so dedicated to the individual that you don't find that in many nonprofits today, let alone within the Second Amendment community, because we both function as a major nonprofit, but we also try to treat people like family. Yeah, and, and we're trying to give people, again, through our programs, uh, basically a direct link to us here. I mean, th this isn't about, you know, an organization says and everybody does. This is a this is a collective thing. We all need to be doing it together. And the role that CRPA plays is in the educational um, opportunistic role 
And it, it also plays, you know, CR, and this is something that I talk with my chapter leadership teams about all the time. You know, we, we have made these relationships with all of these organizations, with all of these legislators throughout, the, throughout our existence. And there are ways that we can ease the path. You know, we can, we can charge ahead and create the path for people to walk through. So if there's a process that we can create that's going to make it easier for you to reach out to your legislator or for you to get the right person on your city council, we're going to do it and we're going to be there, you know, as long as they are promoting the, the Second Amendment values that, that we hold. And we're going to continue working to do that because ultimately that's how you create the change. Yeah, the, the last thing we wanted to handle today was we've been asked this question um, during the past 18 months of COVID, you know, a lot of organizations locked down. What did you do being the CRPA? And, you know, that is a question that I love because it's fun to answer. We didn't shut down, Kevin. No, we didn't. We found new creative ways to keep going and actually throttled up, not down. When everybody else was shutting down, mothballing, we, we had fellow um, friends and other partnership organizations that let go of over half their staff during that time period and now trying to rebuild that block of knowledge base, which is going to take a couple of years for them to do. We didn't do that. No, and, and we were actually on the front lines in a lot of the a lot of the debate that was happening. I, I mean, when the whole debate about whether gun stores should be considered um, essential businesses or not, there was CRPA filing letters um, you know, to keep the gun stores open. And let's hang out there. I mean, our team divided fairly effectively on people in local communities working with those gun stores. I know both you and uh, Roy Griffith were working on a lot of the state issues. I know Roy and I um, started working. I was actually working with people at the White House to try to keep those things open. I mean, we took this from the lowest level of government to the feds and were highly successful in keeping those stores and ranges open and then making sure we could provide emergency training for range safety officers when a lot of the, the current field had to be sequestered because of health reasons. We were able to step in on that. And you know, I know there's a lot of fear because, oh no, we're going into the winter and you know, there's this, these new variants and maybe we're gonna do this again. And I have zero fear over that because I'm like, we did really well. Yeah, I mean, changes had to be made. Yeah, but we were fortunate enough to have a team in place and, uh, you know, a membership base and a volunteer base that adapted quickly. And yeah, we definitely made that change work for us. Yeah, and so I want all of you to be reassured that, no matter what gets thrown at this organization, we're not retreating, we're not running, unless it's directly into the battle. That's the only time you're going to see us run is straightforward. 